What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Illumination Hour. It's me, your host, Ellen. How's everyone doing this week? Are we having a great time reminiscing on the election season of 2016? You know, thinking back on it, um, I think one of the most pressing issues that has come up this year is that of justice. Now, what exactly is justice? That's a great question, and people have been trying to answer that for hundreds of years. I don't know if I'm going to be able to cover every aspect of it because there's just too many. There's so many different arguments about what is right, what is just, what is fair. There's even different perspectives from different philosophers and different authors. There's even different kinds of justice itself. So I'm going to try and discuss the topic today and maybe figure out some aspects of justice that may be right and some that are unnecessary. So I guess the best place to start would be at the beginning. Um, Can we come up with a decent definition of what justice is and then maybe begin to unpack it? Justice can be defined as a a broad notion that is based on concepts of moral rightness that incorporate varying perspectives on fairness, ethics, rationality, religion, and law. In most cases, the idea of justice is divided into two separate categories, social justice and procedural justice. Social justice is generally found in religion and philosophy, while procedural justice is typically associated with the application of laws. It's usually used as a word that is synonymous with fairness. Whether in a courtroom or in the workplace, individuals desire to receive fair treatment. The image of justice is typically depicted wearing a blindfold and holding scales, which are used to weigh both sides of an issue equally. Individuals seek fair and impartial treatment that is not based on skin color, gender, or sexual orientation. But justice can help individuals receive equal treatment. However, it is a multifaceted concept with various meanings across cultures. This is generally the result of different cultures sharing different histories, mythologies, or religion. It's important to remember that justice is directly influenced by the ethics and values of each culture. For that reason, it's easy for justice to become an ambiguous concept for individuals from different cultures. Although there are a few perspectives of justice that are universal across cultures, there is an inadequate amount to create a narrative of universal justice. So... That is kind of difficult to unpack because there's no way that we can universally, unilaterally define what justice is. Everyone thinks that uh, fairness has a different definition, or at least some people do. So let's just start out with a simpler definition, because I do want to get into social versus procedural justice after I go over some different philosophical ideas of what justice are. Uh... But first, I want to start out just with this basic definition of justice, which is that fairness in protection of rights and punishments of wrongs. While all legal systems aim to uphold this ideal through fair and proper administration of the law of the land, it is possible to have unjust laws. Okay, so that sounds fair, right? Justice is the protection of rights and the punishments of wrongs. But... How do we protect people's rights, and who does the punishing of wrongs? 
How do we decide what is right and what is wrong? And this is where it helps to bring in the opinions of other philosophers, because each philosopher has their own definition of what can be deemed as good or bad, right or wrong, and what is fair and what is just. So first, I would like to start by discussing Immanuel Kant and his theory of justice. And I have an article here from libertarianism.org. This is by George H. Smith. It starts out by saying, Immanuel Kant distinguished justice from other moral principles by noting the rules of justice pertain exclusively to external actions and do not depend on virtuous motives for their fulfillment. So this is an important distinguishing feature uh, because in philosophy, when we're talking about justice, there's generally two large groups that people split up into. There's the deontologists who think that moral worth depends on the worth of the intent or will behind the action and not from any real or expected results of the willing or action. So as long as you have a good reason for doing what you did, then you should be in the right. On the other side of the coin, there are the consequentialists who believe that the moral worth of an action depend on the results of that action which means the action is separate from the actor in assessing morality. So it doesn't matter what you meant when you did something. All that matters are the repercussions of that action. Okay, so it says here Kant is a consequentialist. He believes that justice pertains exclusively to external actions and don't depend on the virtuous motives. It is primarily for this reason that only the rules of justice can properly be the subject of human or positive legislation. We can't compel others to be virtuous, since virtue presupposes a free act of the will. But we can rightfully compel others to observe the rules of justice and punish those who violate rights. Okay, so that's fair. We can't make others be good people. But we can punish people who violate other people's rights. So let's lead the story with a highly interesting, if densely written, passage about coercion and freedom from Kant himself. Any opposition that counteracts the hindrance of an effect promotes that effect and is consistent with it. Now, everything that is unjust is a hindrance to freedom according to universal laws. Coercion, however, is a hindrance or opposition to freedom. Consequently, if a certain use of freedom is itself a hindrance to freedom according to universal law, that is, unjust, then the use of coercion to counteract it, inasmuch as it is the preservation of a hindrance to freedom, is consistent with freedom according to universal laws. In other words, this use of coercion is just. It follows by the law of contradiction that justice is united with the authorization to use coercion against anyone who violates justice or a right. And that's from Kant's book, The Metaphysical Elements of Justice, Part 1 of the Metaphysics of Morals. This passage may be difficult to follow, so let's spend a little time unpacking what Kant was getting at here. His basic point is that it is an error to conceive of a juridical right, or a right of justice, as consisting of two separate elements. First, the obligation of others to respect my rights, and second, my right to use defensive force against those who initiate coercion against me in an effort to violate my rights. These are the same thing, viewed from different perspectives. Rights are enforceable moral claims against others. So, in stating that others have an obligation to respect my rights, we are simultaneously affirming my right to use force to protect my rights. A right pertains solely to external actions, not to the inner motives of acting agents. For anyone can still be free, even though I am quite indifferent to this freedom, or even though I might in my heart wish to infringe on this freedom. And since the categorical imperative mandates that natural rights must be universally and equally applicable to every human being, 
since I may not claim a natural right for myself that I deny to others to posit exceptions when I regard those exceptions as expedient, a universal principle of justice means, at least in part, that every person is morally authorized to use force to protect his or her rights. All justice and every right are united with the authorization to use coercion against violators. So, there was something thrown in there that I, I want to expound on a little bit. The categorical imperative. So, Kant believes that there is only one categorical imperative, which can be expressed in two different ways. First, you could say that people should only act in such a way that their maxims or actions could be universal law. Secondly, this could be expressed as act so that you treat humanity, yourself, or others as ends and never as means only. So basically he's saying don't use people. Okay, so don't do things that you wouldn't want to see other people do and don't use people as a means. Also, if you're paying attention, you notice that Kant also answers here, who should be enforcing justice? Here he says that it is each individual who has the right to enforce their own justice. Kant divides rights into two basic types, innate and acquired. An innate right is a natural right that we're born with in the virtue of our rational and volitional nature, or what Kant sometimes calls our humanity. There is only one basic innate right, the right to freedom. Freedom, or independence from the constraint of another's will, insofar as it is compatible with the freedom of everyone else in accordance with universal law, is the one sole and original right that belongs to every human being by virtue of his humanity. By innate, Kant did not mean that the right to freedom is an attribute that we're born with, like fingers, toes, or other physical characteristics that can be observed by the senses. Rather, we know we have rights through the experience of pure reason, or pure practical reason, when reason is applied to the realm of human action. When we understand that humans are morally autonomous agents who must choose to be guided by rational moral principles rather than being determined by our desires, we will also understand that freedom is essential to our exercise of moral autonomy, and that to be forced by others to make the choices they think we should make is a fundamental violation of our moral autonomy. Kant made another significant point in the passage he was attempting to show why the right to freedom does not include the freedom to violate the rights of other people. Indeed, to claim any such right is a contradiction in terms. Why? Because the right to freedom is a universal principle that applies to every rational agent, and to defend a supposed right to violate rights would undercut this universal principle at its very foundation— and ultimately reduce it to absurdity. For Kant, to claim that I have a right is simultaneously to claim that I have a right to use force in defense of my freedom. In using force in this defensive manner, I am attempting to remove a hindrance or opposition to my rightful freedom. But to claim a right by others to violate my right would be to claim that I have a duty not to enforce my right— and any such claim would destroy what is meant by a right in the first place. Also, another very important thing that we have to remember when thinking about what we want to see justice as, we have to remain consistent with it and apply it to each person equally, because each person is, after all, human, and we're trying to make justice universal when Kant affirmed freedom as the fundamental right of rational agents, we must always keep in mind that he meant a freedom that is consistent with his categorical imperative, which means a right to freedom that can be attributed equally to every individual, or a freedom that can be exercised by every person simultaneously without generating conflict. This is why force used to protect our right to freedom is morally justifiable. 
whereas force used to violate our right to freedom amounts to nothing more than mere violence. Any alleged right to restrict the legitimate freedom of others would inject an ineradicable conflict into rights theory and its rules out of court for that reason alone. To forbid by legal means the freedom to violate rights is therefore consistent with freedom according to universal laws of justice. Kant also identified three corollaries of his theory of justice that deserve brief mention. First, justice is concerned only with external actions by which one person can influence other people, whether directly or indirectly. Second, justice is not concerned with the desires, wishes, or needs of other people. These matters pertain to the voluntary virtues of benevolence and charity. Whereas justice is concerned with whether or not we respect the equal freedom of others to live their lives as they see fit. Third, justice is concerned solely with the form of interpersonal relationships, not just with their content. Thus, if I purchase a commodity from a shopkeeper, if the form of that relationship is voluntary... Whether the shopkeeper hopes to profit from the transaction or how much he actually gains, these and similar issues pertain to the content of the transaction and do not fall within the purview of justice. Kant, as we have seen, attempted to ground justice as expressed in terms of individual rights in the moral autonomy of rational agents. This approach distinguished Kant from the many classical liberals who attempted to justify the rules of justice by appealing to their social utility. According to David Hume and similar thinkers, the rules of justice are justified because they are essential to maintaining social order and prosperity, a lesson that we learn from experience. Kant, in stark contrast, appealed neither to social utility nor to experience in his justification of rights and justice. Instead, our basic right to freedom can be justified by pure practical reason, without recourse to empirical observations about the social utility of this right. The right to freedom flows logically from our nature as rational, morally autonomous agents. The social benefits that accrue from respecting rights are a consequence, not a primary justification, of our right to freedom of action. In this respect, Kant's justification of rights was quite similar to that defended by Ayn Rand. Another similarity may be found in Rand's statement, any alleged right of one man which necessitates the violation of rights of another is not and cannot be a right. In addition, Rand and Kant agree that physical force and fraud are the two basic methods by which rights can be violated, and that only retaliatory force is justified. Kant would have agreed wholeheartedly with this characterization of rights by Rand. Thus, for every individual, a right is the moral sanction of a positive of his freedom to act on his own judgment, for his own goals, by his own voluntary, uncoerced choice. As to his neighbors, his rights impose no obligations on them except of a negative kind, to abstain from violating his rights. Of course, these and other similarities between Kant and Rand should not be pushed too far, there are significant differences as well, but one other similarity is worth mentioning, namely, the stress that both philosophers placed on private property rights and external goods. According to Rand, without property rights, no other rights are possible. Kant discusses property rights in more detail than Rand did, and at times his defense may seem convoluted to the modern reader. But the following summary by Howard Williams accurately indicates the importance that Kant attributed to property rights. Kant comes to identify the institution of property with freedom because he sees it in a fundamental sense as an extension of the self, an object which is, he argues, 
my property belongs solely and exclusively to myself, and it is my right to consume or use it in whatever way I please. Indeed, so strongly does the individual feel about his ownership, Kant thinks, that if somebody takes it without his consent, they harm the individual just as much as though they had injured his body. From this point of view, the individual has every justification in feeling as upset about the theft of a favorite book as he has about a bruised knee. To threaten the individual's property, in the sense of its being an extension of the self, prejudices not only his feelings of well-being, but also his very existence. So this is a theory of justice that I can get down with. I believe that Kant is on to some really good, important points here, mainly that people should act in a way that can be universally applied, and also that each individual's rights can be defended. Although he doesn't go into who's supposed to do the defending, I believe it's kind of subsumed under his idea that people are rational beings, and that we, with our individuality, have a right to defend ourselves. Next, I want to discuss another famous philosopher who's much older than Kant, Plato and his theory of justice. This article I have is from ohadmaymen.com, and it's exactly about that, Plato's theory of justice. One search for the meaning of justice in Plato's Republic can finally lead to two definitions. First, that justice is harmony, and second, that justice is doing one's own job, or as Plato likes to put it, doing one's own business and not being a busybody and getting involved in other people's business where you don't belong. Finding these two phrases, however, is hardly enough to get a clear sense of what justice is according to Plato. He offers two main analogies to examine the definition of justice. The division of parts in the soul as well as the parts of the state. Because in Plato's eyes, the state and the soul are essentially the same thing, just on different scales. We will now examine the structure of the soul. The soul is divided into three parts. The appetite, spirit, and the rational the appetite is the part with which it lusts, hungers, thirsts, and gets excited by other appetites. It's the part of the soul that can be hungry for immoral gratification and has no rational consciousness in its desires. That leads us to the need of defining another part in the soul, the one that can keep the appetite restrained, or the part that enables the soul to differentiate between good and bad. The rational part is the part in the soul that calculates, makes balanced decisions having the good of the whole soul as its interest. The third part is the spirit, the part of the soul that is courageous, vigorous, and strong-willed. The spirit, naturally, if it hasn't been corrupted by a bad upbringing, allies with the rational part. By the account of the parts of the soul, we are shown how a soul has different wills, Yet, in order for a soul to stay in the just path, it must have some sort of hierarchy. Plato describes the spirit part as the courageous ally of the rational part which has the control over the appetite. Although the description of the soul might furnish an idea regarding the definition of justice I mentioned above, we should first examine the structure of the state. The state is also divided into three types of people the workers, soldiers, and rulers. It's obvious that the sort of division seems awkward when placed over our own capitalist society. We must keep in mind that in the republic that Plato is describing, each individual is directed by vast education and the utmost care towards the work he could do with excellence. The children in the Republic are separated from their parents at birth and therefore get the same equal chance of becoming workers or rulers without any prejudice regarding their upbringing or family background. Rather, they are evaluated personally, purely according to their natural qualities. 
The workers are the people that are best fitted to practice a specific form of labor, the part of the society whose role is to provide food, clothes, and any other necessities the state requires. They are required to be moderate and obedient to their ruler. The soldiers are the people that are best fitted to fight, people that are spirited and that pass the test of the state by holding firmly to the patriotic attitudes needed in order to defend the state from foreign and domestic enemies. They must possess the virtue of courage and be well educated in order to stay loyal and not harm the citizens, although they are naturally stronger. The rulers are the people who possess the virtue of wisdom. They must not seek the glory and fame of being a ruler. Rather, it should just be perceived as the duty of those who are fitted to rule to take on the burden of ruling their state. The rulers are people that have the interest of the whole in mind. They love their state, and they understand its rules, and therefore will do everything within their power to preserve it. So Plato's idea of republic is not entirely in itself just First of all, because it separates children from their parents at birth, and secondly, because it presumes to decide who gets to be in what class, instead of letting people decide for themselves as rational beings. Anyway, to continue, the division of people into predetermined types in the state is assumed to be done truthfully, according to their natural abilities. To soldiers who cannot understand what possessing wisdom means because they lack it, or to workers that lack both courage and wisdom, Plato uses the noble lie. That is the idea that Mother Nature creates people out of three materials, gold, silver, and bronze, when obviously the golden people are fit to rule, the silver are fit to guard, and the bronze are best naturally fitted to work. Both accounts have a similar structure. Plato claims that justice is the same in the soul and in the state. The resemblance suggests that both the workers and the appetite share the virtue of moderation, for they have to be moderate in their desires. Both the guardians and the spirit share the virtue of courage in order to guard the whole. Finally, both the ruler and the rational share the virtue of wisdom in order to control the workers and the appetite with the help of the guardians or the spirit, all in one goal that is the good of the whole, the state or the soul. Would a soul that lets the appetite part take over and commits criminal acts regardless of their consequences, or allows the spirit to burst into irrational anger, be considered a just soul? This rhetorical question supports the definition of justice as harmony. The condition in which the rational rules the spirited guards, and the appetite remains moderate while they all agree to this condition out of understanding that it is the best for the whole. Could a state in which the cobbler's rule, the guardian is a farmer, and the natural ruler plays the role of a soldier be a good and just state? We must understand that in Plato's state there will be no mistakes in the division of the classes. In order to understand the idea of a just state, we must consider that each individual is practicing the very best activity he is naturally fit for. That society has the most talented cobblers, the most fearsome warriors, and the wisest rulers, each practicing their part with excellence that is considered a virtue, therefore contributing to the virtue of the whole state or person. In the analogy of the state, Plato supports the definition of justice as doing one's own work. It becomes obvious that in order for justice to remain in the state, each person has to do his own work and not meddle with another's. Now that we have found and understood Plato's definition of justice, the question that inevitably has to be asked is how could this justice exist? In other words, why should the workers stay in their own work, or why should the appetite obey the rational? The answer to that comes in the form of both understanding and control. Ideally, all the parts know that maintaining the harmony is good for all, and for the exception, there are the guardians and the spirit to help maintain order. The main problem is yet ahead. Who should be the rulers? Who could be wise enough to rule and to keep the interest of the whole in mind? 
To that, Plato responds with his belief that justice will not exist in its full until the philosophers become kings and the kings became philosophers. What Plato claims is that a king could rule in a just manner, therefore maintain justice, only if he has knowledge of the true form of justice, that is, true knowledge of the forms. The forms represent the ultimate truth, the way things really are in a more knowledgeable sight than the one offered by science. So, without going into Plato's forms, I think we should step back for a moment and consider what we've heard so far. Now, I think Plato has some good points here, in that justice can be considered sticking to your own business, not being a busybody, and remaining in harmony. But perhaps that is only justice on the individual level. Because when it comes to the level of the state, there are many larger questions that need to be considered, such as, is it just to determine someone's future for them without allowing them a say in what they want to do? Just because somebody is good at being a cobbler doesn't mean that they necessarily want to be one. If they had the right to choose on their own, would they choose to be a cobbler or would they choose to strive to be something greater? Well, it is interesting, Plato's view of justice, and I think it's something that we should keep in mind and consider, but not take too seriously, since there are inherent flaws in it. Although, I'm sure there are some people who would want to live in a republic like this, uh, but I am not among one of those people. So next, I want to talk a little bit about John Rawls and his theory of justice. I have a very interesting paper by Dr. Jan Garrett here from people.wku.edu titled John Rawls on Justice. It starts out by asking some questions relating to justice and how we can define it, especially since sometimes justice is defined in terms of specific cultures. Different principles of distributive justice are proposed by different philosophers, does that mean that we may choose any one of them with equal justification? A yes answer to this question would make disputes about fairness impossible to settle. To avoid this, we must find some non-arbitrary method of selecting among proposed principles of justice. One method for resolving the issue might be to follow the traditions of various practices that have grown up over time. For example, the practice of grading students for their performance in academic courses now includes a merit principle for determining most grades. The grade a student receives should reflect the quantity and quality of their work. It might be said in defense of such traditions that they have survived because they have proven more satisfactory to the parties affected, considered collectively, than any other conceivable alternatives, such as giving everyone the same grade or handing out grades in accordance with the student's ability to pay. To argue this way would be to reinforce the argument from tradition, by a kind of utilitarian argument. Let's optimize society's satisfaction. But traditions can be oppressive and unjust. Activities that take place within unjust social systems can themselves be unjust, in spite of their traditional nature. Thus, a practice of giving a person that which is his can be unjust. Suppose this rule is included within a system of slave property. The property in question is a slave, and the practice would require someone meeting an escaped slave to return the slave to his or her master. The fact that the slave system is unjust raises doubts about the justice of activities that occur within this system such as returning escaped property to its owner. What is needed is a way to determine when social systems or the rules of justice that govern society as a whole are just. Such an approach to the selection of rules to distributive justice is provided by John Rawls. Rawls' approach is not utilitarian and does not rely heavily on arguments from tradition. We are to imagine ourselves in what Rawls calls the original position. We are all self-interested rational persons, and we stand behind a veil of ignorance. 
To say that we are self-interested rational persons is to say that we are motivated to select, in an informed and enlightened way, whatever seems advantageous for ourselves. To say that we are behind a veil of ignorance is to say we don't know the following sorts of things. Our sex, race, physical handicaps, generation, social class of our parents, etc., but self-interested rational persons are not ignorant of the general types of possible situations in which humans can find themselves, or the general facts about human psychology and human nature. Self-interested rational persons behind the veil of ignorance are given the task of choosing the principles that shall govern actual worlds. Rawls believes that he has set up an inherently fair procedure here, because of the fairness of the procedure Rawls has described, he says the principles that would be chosen by means of this procedure would be fair principles. A self-interested rational person behind the veil of ignorance would not want to belong to a race or gender or sexual orientation that turns out to be discriminated against. Such a person would not wish to be a handicapped person in a society where handicapped are treated without respect. So, principles would be adopted that oppose discrimination. Likewise, a self-interested rational person would not want to belong to a generation which has been allocated a lower-than-average quantity of resources. So, they would endorse the principle, each generation should have roughly equal resources, or each generation should leave the next at least as many resources as they possessed at the start. The corollary of this, in right terms, is that all generations have the same rights to resources, future as well as present. Rawls argues that self-interested rational persons behind the veil of ignorance would choose two general principles of justice to structure the society in the real world. First, the principle of equal liberty. Each person has an equal right to the most extensive liberties compatible with similar liberties for all. This is an egalitarian viewpoint. And secondly, difference principles. Social and economic inequalities should be arranged so that they are both to the greatest benefit of the least advantageous person and attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of equal opportunity. This is egalitarian since it distributes extensive liberties equally to all persons. It is also quite egalitarian since it distributes opportunities to be considered for offices and positions in an equal manner. Giving the greatest benefits to the least advantageous person is not egalitarian but makes benefit for some, those with greater talents or training, proportionate to their contribution towards benefiting the least advantaged person. The principle of equal liberty obviously echoes, without exactly duplicating libertarianism in its commitment to extensive liberties. What does the difference principle mean, though? It means that society may undertake projects that require giving some persons more power, income, status, etc., than others, such as paying accountants and upper-level managers more than assembly line operatives, provided that the following conditions are met. First, the project will make life better off for the people who are now worse off, for example, by raising the living standard of everyone in the community and empowering the least advantaged person to the extent consistent with their well-being. And, access to the privileged position is not blocked by discrimination according to irrelevant criteria. The difference principle has elements of other familiar ethical theories. The socialist idea that responsibilities or burdens should be distributed according to ability and benefits according to need is partly contained within the difference principle. We may reasonably assume that the least advantaged have the greatest needs and that those who receive special powers, hinted at under social inequalities, also have special responsibilities or burdens. However, the merit principle that the use of special skills should be rewarded is also included in the difference principle. What the difference principle does not permit is a change in social and economic institutions that makes life better for those who are already well-off, but does nothing for those who are 
already disadvantaged or makes their life worse. For example, policies that permit nuclear power plants which degrade the environment for nearby family farmers but provide jobs for already well-paid professionals who come into the big cities. I do have some questions regarding John Rawls' principles of justice. I don't question the principle of equal liberty. Uh, that sounds very fair, in that each person has an equal right to the most extensive liberties compatible with similar liberties for all. What I do have questions with is the difference principle, that social and economic inequality should be arranged so that they are to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged person and attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of equal opportunity. Where I see the problem is that social and economic inequalities are not something that should be decided by a ruling class. Because that's what this principle assumes, is that there is a ruling class of people who are making the decisions of who gets what advantages. Even if these rules of society were determined by the entire society, there is no way that everybody would agree on what is just. There are certain people who would not want to give up their money that they've earned to people who are disadvantaged. Equally, there may be some disabled people who don't want to take advantage of people who are doing a larger share of the work or taking on more of the burdens. This whole principle of justice has a feeling of being centrally planned and controlled, and that is not the way that society thrives. Society thrives when individuals are able to make decisions for themselves, as people are self-interested and rational. If we are self-interested and rational, then can we not decide what is right for ourselves? Or do we need the rest of society to help us and tell us what they think is best? Anyway, I'm not here to give you all the answers. I'm just here to help you explore this topic. So now we've explored a few different philosophers' ideas of what justice is. This brings me to my favorite part of the show for tonight, which is going to be discussing what justice means in modern times. And it's really a lot simpler, and we don't have to go into philosophers anymore. This is just definitions of what is currently. And currently... Justice can be split up into two separate branches. First, there's procedural justice. Secondly, there is social justice. And that is a major buzzword, especially over the past couple years. Social justice has ballooned in size and popularity. I can't turn on the radio or look at basically any website without seeing some mention of social justice. Anyway, because that is such a big, exciting topic, <laughs> uh, I'm going to save that for last. And first, I'm going to cover procedural justice, which focuses on the way police and other legal authorities interact with the public and how the characteristics of those interactions shape the public's view of the police, their willingness to obey the law, and actual crime rates. This is from trustinjustice.org. They say that, Mounting evidence shows that community perceptions of procedural justice can have significant impact on public safety. Procedural justice is based on four central principles, treating people with dignity and respect, giving citizens voice during encounters, being neutral in decision-making, and conveying trustworthy motives. Let's break that down a little bit. Treating people with dignity and respect. So I'm assuming what they mean here is they are trying to respect people's individuality and their right as independent beings. And treating people with dignity, that is more so along the lines of treating somebody as if they are worthy of your honor or respect. So basically we can say that when they try to treat people with dignity, they try to not talk down to them or condescend. 
again, these are just goals of the procedural justice system. That's not to say that the individuals within that system actually obey these rules. So next, giving citizens voice during encounters. I suppose that means allowing people to talk to police officers <laughs> when they get pulled over or uh, being able to speak their minds to judges. Being neutral in decision making. I, I suppose that means not having a bias when you're considering someone's case or weighing both sides equally. Although I have to say that humans are really not good at that when they have biases. Uh, everybody does, whether they realize it or not. Some people just express them more strongly. And generally, I would say people in positions of power tend to hold their biases more closely than people who don't seek out power. And finally, we have conveying trustworthy motives. Now, what does that remind you of? That reminds me of the deontologists who think that moral worth depends on the worth of the intent or will behind the action, not from any real or expected results of the willing or action. So this is interesting. This is the first time I have heard or read, at least in this show, a viewpoint where the deontologists coincide with the consequentialist. So basically they're saying not only do the consequences matter, but also our intentions matter. They're somehow equal parts of an entire whole that is justice. It's unfortunate that it is coming from this article, this source, but I believe that intentions do matter on some level to people. After all, it's an often cited excuse for things to make people feel better. Well, it must be true that most people see intention on an equal level, or at least consider it in coincidence with the consequences of actions, because research demonstrates that these principles contribute to relationships between authorities and the community, in which, one, the community has trust and confidence in the police as honest, unbiased, benevolent, and lawful, Two, the community feels obligated to follow the laws and the dictates of legal authorities. And three, the community feels that it shares a common set of interests and values with the police. So in this situation, police are acting as the enforcers of just laws, supposedly. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier, laws can be unjust. And police are are humans just like everyone else, and they all have their own biases and make mistakes sometimes. But I suppose if you're looking at the society as a whole, you would want to follow the dictates of legal authorities because you would think that it was best for everyone. However, most people are more self-interested than that and do not feel obligated to follow every law. <laughs> In fact, it's almost impossible to not break a law every single day. Most people speed on their way to work or use their phone while they're driving. It's as simple as something like that, and you've broken the law. You violated a dictate of the authorities. And although it was good for you individually, uh, perhaps you had some important message you had to return. It's not good for society as a whole, therefore you must be punished. But in that situation, who is more justified? Is it you for defending your right to do what you want with your possessions? Or is it the enforcer of society's will, the police, who's trying to defend everyone else's life against you? Regardless, there is a procedure, and procedurally just policing is essential to the development of goodwill between police and communities, and is closely linked to improving community perceptions of police legitimacy, the belief that the authorities have the right to dictate proper behavior. So, people obeying the laws gives the law justification. And there are many common examples of situations when people do not obey laws, and it's largely because they don't believe that the laws are legitimate. 
Anyway, research shows that when communities view police authority as legitimate, they're more likely to cooperate with police and obey the law. Establishing and maintaining police legitimacy promotes the acceptance of police decisions, correlates with high levels of law abidingness, and makes it more likely that police and communities will collaborate to combat crime. I don't even want to get into how creepy that sounds. A key component of the research is that the public is especially concerned that the conduct of authorities be fair, and this factor matters more to them than whether outcomes of particular interactions favor them. This means that procedurally just policing is not consonant with traditional enforcement-focused policing, which typically assumes compliance is a function primarily of emphasizing to the public the consequences, usually formal punishment, of failing to follow the law. Policing based on formal deterrence encourages the public's association of policing primarily with enforcement and punitive outcomes. Procedurally just policing, on the other hand, emphasizes values that police and communities share. Shared values based on a common conception of what social order is and how it should be maintained. And encourages the collaborative, voluntary maintenance of law-abiding communities. Research indicates that this latter approach is far more effective at producing law-abiding citizens than the former. This makes intuitive sense. People welcome being treated as equals with a stake in keeping their community safe, as opposed to being treated as subjects of a capricious justice system enforced by police who punish them for ambiguous, if not arbitrary, reasons. It does make intuitive sense. And I wonder why, if it was so intuitive, for the longest time, we have had a justice system based on punitive outcomes. It's very obvious, even based on the most simple scientific experiments, that when punished, animals and people do not respond well. They don't act out of their own will anymore, they act purely out of fear. And fear makes people do crazy things. If people feel like they are working in cooperation with each other and don't have any fears of what might happen to them if they do something wrong, or at least have less fears, then they are more likely to behave in a way that is natural to them. They're more likely to do what they want, and not just what you want them to. So, that is what procedural justice is. It's mainly focusing on the way that people interact with the uh, justice system and how these interactions shape the way people view the system that they live under. So that's just the one side of justice. On the other side, we have social justice. And although we've all heard stories about social justice, I just want to define more what it is, essentially. Uh, And this definition comes from appstate.edu. It's written by the Department of Government and Justice Studies. So what is social justice? Well, it's defined as promoting a just society by challenging injustice and valuing diversity. So that doesn't sound so bad, challenging injustice. Uh, That's what people should do Anyway, it's their moral obligation as independent, rational beings. Justice should be applied equally to everyone. So when justice is not applied equally, injustice exists, therefore undermining the entire idea of justice. So it is right for people to challenge injustice. And the next thing they mentioned was valuing diversity. Now, sure, on the surface that sounds great, but... How far do we take valuing diversity? Do we take it to the level to where a person is denied a job solely because they're white and the company already has 90% white employees? So do we begin to treat people unfairly in order to value diversity? Well, that doesn't seem quite right. Sure, diversity can be a good thing. Especially when you're looking at it from a biological standpoint, having a wider variety of biological diversity actually enhances the health of the ecosystem as a whole. But that's not to say that people 
need to create a bias for diversity, thereby undermining individual justice. Anyway, social justice exists when all people share a common humanity and therefore have a right to equitable treatment, support for their human rights, and a fair allocation of community resources. That's actually not true. People don't have a right to equitable treatment. They don't have a right to any sort of treatment, really. They have a right to their own freedom and justice. But that doesn't mean that they have a right to somebody's goodwill. That doesn't mean that they have a right to tell somebody to be nice to them. Next, support for their human rights. Well, sure, that sounds nice again, but that doesn't mean that because it sounds nice, it's logical. Again, you cannot force somebody to support you or your human rights. You have to be your own arbiter in that situation. Again, isn't being an individual about taking individual responsibility? The final part of that statement, a fair allocation of community resources. Hmm, well, doesn't that sound a lot like socialism? And we all know how well that turns out. Where everybody shares everything equally, but not everyone does a fair amount of the work. What incentive is there for anybody to allocate fairly common resources? If they're common, everybody's going to want a piece of them, and the biggest piece they can get. So there's really no way that we can ensure the right to equitable treatment, support for human rights, or a fair allocation of community resources. But this is supposedly what is socially just. In conditions of social justice, people are not to be discriminated against, nor their welfare and well-being constrained or prejudiced on the basis of gender, sex, religion, political affiliation, age, race, belief, disability, location, social class, socioeconomic circumstances, or any other characteristic of background or group membership. So we are supposed to just view people unilaterally as the same. But that doesn't seem realistic. I mean, how can we treat everybody exactly the same? It doesn't seem to work out in real-world situations. Yet to be socially just, we must see everybody as absolutely equal in everything. I'm sorry, but the universe is just too chaotic for that. There are no two people that are equal in almost anything. I mean, sure, everybody has the equal status as a person and deserves equal respect for their individuality and their property, but everything else is already defined by them. Each person individually decides what their sexuality, their religious stance, political stance, beliefs are. Most people decide where they're living or what social class they're in by, you know, what job they choose and how hard they work. People can even decide now what gender they want to be. And like it or not, these aspects of a person do color the way that we judge them. That doesn't mean we should unfairly judge them. I don't think racism or sexism is a good lens to look at the world through. It's certainly unfair, but that's because it doesn't make any sense. It's irrational. And it's unfortunate, but it's that person's fault if they choose to live their life in an irrational way. That doesn't mean that you have a right to make them not see the world through the lens of racism or sexism or whatever it is. They have just as much right to their opinion as you do. And to silence that opinion is to silence valuable discussion that should be had for the mutual benefit of everyone. People learn and grow from these sorts of discussions. But to continue, social justice is generally equated with the notion of equality or equal opportunity in society. Although equality is undeniably part of social justice, the meaning of social justice is actually much broader. Further, equal opportunity and similar phrases such as personal responsibility have been used to diminish the perspective for realizing social justice by justifying enormous inequalities in modern society. Wow. So, saying that people should be responsible for their own actions justifies inequalities in society? If that is the logical basis for this argument for social justice, I cannot buy that. 
if everybody was personally responsible, they wouldn't have to rely on everybody else in the world to be responsible. It's just not a wise decision personally, and also would never work out if you relied on everyone else for the way you felt, or if you relied on everyone else to make the changes in your life that you wanted to see. Justice today is a very poorly formed idea of what justice should be ideally. It's enforced in such a way that there really is no justice, and the two branches of justice, which are social and procedural, are both very flawed. Social justice is completely flawed. I don't think that this movement should even exist because it's based on the idea that people are not responsible for their own actions. Procedural justice at least allows for that, that people are responsible for their own actions. But it also heavily focuses on the authority figures and the police enforcing the laws and the subjects who are supposed to abide by those rules. I don't have to tell you again that I think that's unfair. But of the two sides of justice, I would say that once you have the basis of what just is, the protection of rights and the punishment of wrongs, fairness to every individual, the ability to protect yourself against wrongs, the ability for you to live your life in accordance with what is right to you. Once we have that theory of justice together, we don't need social justice. Before I ramble on too much further, I have to wrap this show up, so thank you so much everybody for listening to this episode. If you have any questions or comments, please email me at illuminationhour@gmail.com. Thanks again, everyone. See you next week.